you want to become rich? Well, in today's show, we're going to show you the habits you're going to have to form if you'd like to become more rich, more successful, get further in life. And it's part of a series of podcasts I've been doing with finder.com.au. And this is one of their pocket money podcasts where Mark and Sally ask me the sort of questions that you're probably thinking about. Maybe you've been wondering about what makes the rich the multimillionaires different to everyone else, well, apart from having more money. So you're going to enjoy the probing questions, the facts, the fun, the discussion I'm going to have. It's a replay of the Pocket Money podcast where they interviewed me. And at the end of it, you're going to come out understanding the daily routines and habits of successful people so you can emulate them. So welcome to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's most trusted property commentator who has once again been voted Australia's leading property investment advisor. That's the fifth time he's won a similar award in the last seven years. Welcome back to Pocket Money. Today, Sally and I spoke with Michael Yardney, one of Australia's leading property commentators and host of the Michael Yardney podcast. He's also an author of some great books about property investment, which I've read in the past, and also the book Rich Habits, Poor Habits, which is all about the habits you should adopt and the habits you should avoid if you want to become rich. So without further ado, here's Michael Yardney. Just for those who may not know who you are and what you do in this space, maybe you could introduce yourself. Sure. I'm getting into my middle to late 60s, but I've been investing since uh, I was in my early 20s. I bought my first investment property for $18,000. $18,000. And I took a 30-year mortgage. I wasn't sure how I was going to pay it. Over the years, I've built a substantial property portfolio. I run Metropole Property Strategists, a national firm of strategic property advisors and buyers agents. We have a wealth advisory and a financial planning arm as well. But my interest is in the psychology of success, the psychology of why people get rich. And so I write about it at propertyupdate.com.au and on the popular Michael Yardney podcast. And I've had eight books published on it. So I think I can teach you a little bit about pocket money. Yes, just a little bit. (laughs) What a resume. (laughs) So I've read Rich Habits, Poor Habits, and I've also read one of your books on property investment, and they've both been really helpful. Uh, Today, we're going to be tackling the different habits and secrets to getting rich, uh, and we're going to pick out a few of them and just sort of tackle them in detail. But my first question was, how did you initially connect the dots and recognize that mindset is actually the most important ingredient to become wealthy or successful in, in finance? Well, years ago, I started conducting seminars and I'd talk in front of a couple of hundred people. And Mark, what would happen was half a dozen people would actually take action and do something. And guess what the rest of them did? Nothing. Nothing. (laughs) So I wanted to be good at my job like other people wanted to be good at their job. So I then did longer seminars. I did evening ones. I did weekend ones. I had multi-speaker events. And you know what happened? We gave all this great information and... Half a dozen people at 10, 15% did something and the vast majority did nothing. And that made me wonder, why is it that in Australia, where we've got all the information and the ability to become wealthy, why do some people become rich, successful? And by the way, the two are not related. I see a lot of rich people who are not in my mind successful or wealthy because they're unhappy, they're miserable. So this isn't a judge of people, but most of us want more choices in life, that fancy car, exotic holidays, the luxury house. And, and so why is it that most people don't get it? And I spent many, many years studying that and then eventually mentoring people. And I teamed up with Tom Corley, a CPA, who'd done a five-year study in the United States about that. And we put it together in our book, Rich Habits, Poor Habits. Yeah, it's interesting that your mindset and I guess the psychology around it 
like plays such a massive part. I don't think that a lot of people would think that when it comes to their money. But a little while ago, we did an episode on pocket money about the whole five movement. So financial independence, retire early. And so much of that was about, okay, well, how do I change my mindset? And I think that's the first step. Very much so. But there's actually a step before that. It's actually recognition of where you are and what's going on. So you're 100% right that in anything, these skills are learnable and you can change. I learned many years ago that the thoughts lead to your feelings, your feelings lead to your actions, your actions lead to your results. Your thoughts and feelings are internal, your actions and your results are external. So your outside world is really a reflection of what's going on inside. And early in life, we're taught things like dirty money, filthy rich. And so if you're taught that wealthy people are dirty, nasty, have raped, robbed, pillaged, then what happens is if you suddenly come into some money and you want to be a good person, subconsciously you think, hey, that's not right. I don't want to be that way. And so I see many people sabotage themselves, Sally, and don't get to the next level. Let's move on to the actual habits themselves, shall yeah, we? And jump in. Dig in. Uh, so let's tackle the first habit, rich people plan their future. So what should you do if you actually don't know what your goal should be when it comes to money or where you should even start? Well, I guess the first step is to educate yourself and understand, and there's some great resources like this podcast, and may I say the Michael Yardley podcast, and and, uh, there's lots of good blogs on uh, Finder and many other places. So educate yourself. So become aware that there is a potential. Also recognize that if it's going to change, you have to change. So what you've got to do is start making some plans. We're talking about the a small group today we can only cover of the habits that successful people have done. And the reason I'm suggesting we do that is because if you emulate other people, if you follow other successful people, not just by what they're doing, but you've got to go deeper how they're thinking, then you're likely to become like them. So if you uh, eat like healthy people eat and you exercise like healthy people exercise and think like healthy people think, you're going to change your body shape and your weight and your your health. And much the same with successful people. So we've got to understand what they do. And successful people plan. They plan by the day. They actually know where they're heading and anything they do in general points them to where they want to go in the long term. So they have daily, weekly, uh, monthly goals. And making money is one thing, but you actually have to create wealth. So a lot of people have got good incomes, but they actually don't at the end of the month have anything left over to show for it. And that translates to at the end of the year, at the end of their lifetime when they retire with just a home and nothing else. That's actually a really interesting point. And that's also one of the other habits, which is um, the rich are good savers. And just to bounce around a little bit through the book, if there's one habit that's more important above all else, do you think that that is the one? Like in my mind, saving is like almost like the cornerstone before anything else is possible. No, Mark, there's one before that, and that's understanding the importance of delayed gratification. Because when you understand that, then the saving will have a purpose. So there's a mindset prevalent today of instant gratification. We're living in an on-demand society that looks for quick results and unfortunately, in some ways, with very little effort. Now, the rich know that life doesn't work that way. They know that you've got to put sweat equity into it. So therefore, some people are going to leave school straight away and get a job so they get some income straight away and they're not going to invest time in their education. Others will spend six years going to university to become an architect, a lawyer, a doctor, and then they're going to have more income that's going to give them the potential in the future to uh, save and uh, and become rich. Others show delayed gratification in other ways. What you said a moment ago, they save. They actually spend less than they earn. They save the difference and they invest it. And they then bring their future forward by planning and know why they're doing it. Delayed gratification is a really interesting concept because like you said, you know, now more than ever, we do live in a world where instant gratification is definitely a thing. Like you can get anything you want, purchase basically anything with basically just like one button on your phone. So do you think that it's potentially harder than ever to really switch to that delayed gratification mindset? Or do you have any tips, especially for young people, you know, who are really starting to figure out their finances, but have grown up, you know, potentially in this world of the internet and being able to get everything they want at their fingertips? Sally, you're right. 
it is harder because when I grew up, I actually had to save because there wasn't credit cards. Think about that. No credit cards. So you couldn't Whoa. put it on a credit card and there wasn't tap and go and there wasn't after pay. The problem is most people don't recognise that the limit on their credit card isn't their money. It's somebody else's money that you're paying a privilege to use for and paying a, an expensive cost for using it. So to go to the tips that you're talking about, Sally, my suggestion would be when you're online and you're about to do something, put something in your shopping cart and don't click send, don't click yes, don't click buy. Think, is it a need or is it a want? Do you really need it? And I'd actually go away for an hour and come back and if you still need it, not want it, then click OK and go ahead. And for bigger items, then I'd actually wouldn't just wait an hour and leave it in the shopping cart. I'd think about it overnight. That's such a good tip and I actually do that all the time, especially if, if it is exactly not a need it's more of a, a want I'll put it in the shopping cart and then just leave it there for a couple of days and then it's almost like I feel like by putting it in the cart I've got that like gratification and then in like a week I'm like oh I don't even want this anymore like I'm over this now well that's delayed gratification gold star for me <laughs> well done Sally <laughs> you should have written this book <laughs> <laughs> Michael, I wanted to touch back on the habit about education. How much education do you need or should you get if you prefer to work with an expert, for example, like a financial advisor or a buyer's agent in property? Yeah, if you prefer to work with them on building your wealth. Well, the concept of education is one of the success habits of wealthy people. And even if you read Warren Buffett, one of Australia, the world's richest people, who's a multi-billionaire, he still spends hours every day reading and learning. So one of the success habits we found of wealthy people is educating themselves and reading. They read daily, but not for entertainment. They read to educate themselves. They upgrade their skills. They upgrade their knowledge to make themselves more valuable in their job. But I also believe that even if you're going to outsource, and I hope people do outsource their property buying services to our team at Metropole, you should never outsource the knowledge. So whether you go to a financial planner or a buyer's agent, you should have the knowledge and know the right questions to ask because unfortunately, there are many different classes of financial advisors, buyer's agents, real estate agents, uh, people ready to take your money while there's others who are on your side. How do you tell the difference? That's by you having the basic knowledge and knowing the right questions to ask, Mark. We asked some of those questions just the other week when we did an episode with an award-winning financial advisor. So we knew we knew we had the goods, Charlie Viola. But we were like, where do you start? I've never had to use a financial advisor before. So I was like, what questions would you even go in and ask? You obviously need to have a plan. He gave us quite a few great tips, especially for newbies who are like coming into it and they don't know where to start. Mm. So I think that's definitely a good point. Educating yourself before you even get that expert advice is is definitely essential. But the fact that you're asking for advice is another rich habit. Blaine, you can run faster, but together you can actually run further. If you're the smartest person in your team, you're in trouble. You can't be an expert at everything. So I still have mentors. I still seek advice. And that's actually one of the other habits of wealthy people. They seek advice, they have mentors, but they're prepared to pay for it. Yeah, this is always a question I have when it comes to mentors, uh, especially mentors that are, you know, friends or just someone that you know that you look up to. I always have the question of how you approach them without sounding like you just want free advice or you just want to just tap them for information and then leave. Do you have any tips about how to approach that? Sure. So part of it, Mark, is hanging around the right people because you've probably read that you're the average of the five people you hang around the most. So if you wear Lycra and ride a bike every weekend because all your other friends do, it's very likely you're going to be fit and healthy. If you go to uh, sit on the couch each night and eat potato chips and watch The Simpsons, it's very likely that your mates are all going to be much the same as well. They say that your network is your net worth. In other words, 
if you lie with dogs, you're going to come up with fleas. So if you hang around the right people, <laughs> I love that. the conversations you're going to have with them, the natural conversations you're going to have with them are going to be encouraging, enlightening. They're not going to say, no, you can't achieve that. Oh, what do you think about? Why would you even want to save? What are you on about? You should get the latest handbag, the latest boots. So it'll be part of the natural conversations Mark, rather than the questions you have to ask them if you're hanging around the right people because they talk about different things. Yeah, and that's right. And I think that's one of the points of the book as well is removing toxic people out of your life. And, you know, like you said, they might be the people who are saying, oh, you know, you can't do this or, oh, you should indulge yourself a little bit and buy that. You know? <laughs> Why are you looking at me when you say that, Mark? That's it. I'm cutting you out. No more, no more of your toxicity in my life. <laughs> Sally's a bad influence. Um, <laughs> that's great advice. Uh, you, you touched on also the fact that rich people are generally prepared. They do get started on these kinds of things early. And that is one of the habits that future millionaires get an early start with with wealth building. Uh, so Sally and I are both sort of in our 20s. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, approaching the 3 -0. <laughs> Oh, no, uh, <laughs> dirty, dirty. But does that mean that it's sort of too late for us? No, it's never too late. But it takes a long time to create wealth, particularly in today's low interest rate, low wages, low return environment. So I don't know what the world's going to be like when you retire. I don't know if there's going to be a pension. I don't know whether you're going to be able to use your super, how you're going to be able to use your super, whether there's going to be negative gearing. I don't know who the government's going to be. What I do know, though, is if you have a substantial asset base, you're going to have choices. So what investors should be doing is building, not for cash flow, but building for asset-based growth. So that's why, to my mind, well-located residential real estate in the capital cities is a great way to invest because over time, you're going to build a substantial asset base. So no, it's not too late, but it takes 20 to 30 years to build a big asset base. I know there are get-rich-quick schemes out there in the share market and the property market. Come along to my weekend seminar and you can leave your job. You, know, you can buy six properties in six minutes or 10 properties in 10 years. doesn't work that way. A get-rich-quick is a way of making other people rich but uh, helping you get poor quickly as well. Uh, these schemes don't work. So take time, be patient. And the biggest asset people your age have got is actually your earning capacity. You've got another 20, 30 years of earning capacity. And I don't know what your income is, but if the people listening to this have a think about it, multiply their income out, they've got millions of dollars still coming to them. What are they going to do with it? So they should take advantage of that. And part of it is recognizing the need. And that's where this Pocket Money podcast is really helpful because it makes them think, hey, I actually should spend less than I earn, put aside the bit of difference and, and start getting into something. So there's still hope for us yet, Mark. We're not doomed. <laughs> You're not doomed because of the significant earning capacity that you have got. That's a great asset. Life changes. You've got to buy a house. You have kids. You've got to pay kinder fees, school fees, whatever. But the answer is most of us get a little raise. And as the raise goes up, as your income goes up, you get a better car, you move into a better apartment, you buy nicer clothes, and it's called bracket creep, and you don't have anything left to show. So I see lots of people who earn high incomes, but still rent and still haven't actually saved. So what you've got to do is what the tax man does. Remember, the tax man doesn't trust you to pay the tax at the end of the year. They take a percentage out every week, every fortnight, month, whenever you get paid, knowing that you're not going to remember to do it at the end of the year. And similarly, your saving should be automated as well. So if you put aside 10, 15% starting today, and then you live on what's left. Yeah, that's great advice. That's that's something that I try to do mm -hmm. and oftentimes I succeed, but then there is also like months where it is harder to save, unexpected things pop up, which is why you need to save in the first place, mm -hmm. right? It's like a cycle. The money comes out first, Mark, and then you're left with what you're left with. We all have fixed expenses like the rent or mortgage or, or fixed payments, and then there's discretionary expenses. And what you do is you 
Therefore, put it in little buckets. What's left over for your variable expenses? Well, yeah, if it's a tough week, you eat baked beans or go back to mum for a week or or, or for a meal. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's actually a great point, even thinking about my own grandparents. Like they they grow a lot of their food. They have a little garden. And they when they came to Australia, obviously that was like a way of saving money. But they've done that literally, they're in their mid-80s now, still doing it. And they just save all their pennies I love that. Imagining them have like different jars for like every. (laughs) Thing is that what you do, Mark? Oh, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to splash out on jars. That's why I haven't done that. (laughs) I guess the equivalent, the modern day equivalent of that is there are so many apps out there that you can track your spending and see the different areas that you're spending on, like food, entertainment, whatever it is, and then obviously necessities, and you can figure out like where your money is going. And then I guess if you have different savings accounts for different things or divide your money, you know, you have like your savings and you have money put aside for the fixed expenses that you mentioned, and then you have what's left for for fun. Mm. What you're talking about, Sally, is budgeting. Now, for a lot of people, budgeting is they think, oh, that's, I'm going to work out what I spent last month. And that's not the case. What you actually should be doing is budgeting where your money is going to go in, in, in the future. And and there are definitely apps you can do that because when you do, you're going to suddenly realise where your money's gone. A couple of weeks ago, I was actually sitting, uh, having a chat with a couple of our property managers who manage our clients' properties, and they were actually outside the building having a smoke. They were wanting to get ahead financially too, and I said to them, hey, can we just do a quick sum? How many cigarettes are you smoking a day, a week? How much is that costing you? And how much is it costing a year? But they were spending, as a couple, $300 a week. And when we multiplied that by 50, they understood that that was almost the deposit on a car or a price of a car or well along the way of getting a home. Just burning your money away. Literally burning (laughs) your money away. Exactly, exactly. The other habit that a lot of people have, a bad habit, a poor habit, is gambling. And the reason poor people tend to gamble is they see it as their way out of the rat race. So they buy the lotto tickets. They see, oh, look, the rich, they've got a lot of choices. I haven't. I'll never get out. So I'm actually going to gamble. The rich know that gambling is a tax for people who can't do maths. You can't win the lottery. That's such a good point and it's such a massive issue uh, in Australia. On the other side of that, another, I guess, behaviour of rich people that kind of seems a little bit counterintuitive is that they're generous and give to charity. So can you talk a little bit through that? Because I know the the saying is that the rich save rich by spending like the poor, right? Well, no, they don't. It's one of the things that I come across. So we, I personally support a number of charities. Uh, we've run three charity balls. My wife, Pam, has. And only yesterday she was talking about it. It happens to be her birthday today, the day we're doing this podcast. Happy birthday, birthday, Pam. Hey, happy birthday, Pam. I'll let her know. And one of the things is that she's giving, even though I've given her a birthday gift, she's giving a large amount to her favourite charity, very special kids. But the wealthy give to charity and the wealthy recognise that when you get to the top, you've got to send the lift down to bring other people up. While the poor actually don't see that, they don't see all the quiet, silent stuff that the wealthy do. So they think the rich are greedy. Not the case at all. In fact, once a year for five days on the Gold Coast, I run Wealth Retreat, which is a $10,000 five-day event that a lot of wealthy people come to to get to the next level. And others would think they look from the outside and say, why would a group of already very successful wealthy people go in a room to move further forward? And when you hear what their goals and their plans are, a lot of it has to do with contribution and giving back. It's one of the bits in the DNA of all wealthy people, Sally. That's lovely. Yeah. So we've been armed with so many tips of both the poor and the rich. We know what to do and what not to do. But to wrap up, we thought we'd go through a bit of a rapid fire round of underrated or overrated. So we'll give you a topic or a saying, and then you can quickly say underrated or overrated, and we'll we'll get your tips. So first one, one of my favorites always, money advice like don't buy coffee or smashed avocado. That's correct. Did I say underrated or overrated? Because you waste so much on that when you could make your coffee yourself. So that's a highly rated advice. 
But it doesn't taste as yeah, good, no, Michael. Yeah, I know. I'm like, damn it, that's not the answer I wanted. <laughs> but can I tell you that now I can afford the best cappuccino machine in my house and in my office. I can afford to go to the best restaurants and the best uh, places for my lunch. Delayed gratification. What about your thoughts on cryptocurrencies, underrated or overrated? I would never invest in any asset class or business unless I know enough about it. And I believe at the moment it's been overrated. I don't think enough people understand about it. And the only people that are seeming to make some money out of it are, are the ones who are trying to teach others about it. Wait a while before you get involved. Following on from that, but obviously much more in the sort of more accepted traditional routes of making money, uh, you're obviously into property, but uh, investing in shares, overrated or underrated? Oh, I think it's a great investment class. So it's probably underrated. Most of us have shares in our super fund because it's everybody who's employed, their employer, their boss takes 9% out and puts it in the super. So that's a form of forced saving for the future. The trouble is you can't access that till you're 60 or the rules may change and it'll probably be more later on. So one has shares there. Shares is a good investment class because it brings some cash flow in, but it's actually not a capital growth asset class. And it's also very, very much more volatile. So a few weeks ago, there was all the big fuss that the share market hit the highest point it had for 10 years. It got back to where it was in the global financial crisis. In the meantime, property values have doubled and doubled in value again. So shares have got their place. Okay. What about RBA interest rate cuts? Underrated or overrated? Well, the RBA is on a mission at the moment to get unemployment down, and it's saying it wants to bring it down to 4.5%, and it's currently about 5%. Now, that's a good task, but I don't think the lower interest rates are going to bring it down, so they're overrated, because at the moment, we're getting a higher participation rate. More people are going back into the workforce. So we've got more people employed than ever, but a lot of them are underemployed. They're not doing the jobs they want. So I just recently read that the if you add together the unemployment rate and the underemployment rate, together that comes to 13.5%. And that's why wages aren't going up, because there's still capacity, spare capacity in the market, uh, in the employment market. But the low interest rates are going to give another boost to property values. Awesome. What do you think about artificial intelligence, especially when it comes to jobs? Because I know you've recently written about this. I see the job market changing considerably over the next decade. I read recently that 30, 40% of jobs in Australia are going to be gone by 2030. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to be unemployed, but the jobs that you and I and some other people are doing won't be around because there's going to be a whole lot of new ones. And definitely artificial intelligence is going to replace certain jobs. And the other factor to take into account is certain jobs are going to be offshored and go to other parts of the world. So I guess the job you've got, I've got today, we're very likely going to be in a different one in five or seven years' time. Uh, but that's okay. I, I still actually have a lot of confidence in Australia as a nation because we're in the middle of Southeast Asia, which is a huge growing economy. And last but definitely not least... In the wise, wise words of Biggie Smalls, what about the saying, more money, more problems? Underrated or overrated? Totally overrated. Let me <laughs> tell you a different thing. Michael Yardney's words, any problem that money can solve is not a problem. So if your car breaks down and your credit card is maxed out and you can't get it fixed, that is a problem. If my car breaks down, my biggest problem is where's the 1-800 number to ring the people who are going to tow it and take it into the uh, shop and fix it up and give me a loan car in the meantime. But that is the poor thinking that has held so many Australians back. And maybe the way of finishing off this show is to understand why people say that. And it's come from well-meaning parents and people because it helps justify that they haven't been successful financially. So if those rich people have got more problems, if those rich people aren't generous and give to charity, if those rich people are greedy, if they must have robbed or taken advantage of people to get rich, then it's not bad for me to be poor. 
doesn't work that way. In Australia, we've got this tall poppy syndrome. Tom Corley, my co-author of Rich Habits, Poor Habits, who's in America, when I mentioned that to him, he said, what's that mean? And I said, oh, when people stick up their heads and say I'm successful, they lop them off. And he said, we don't have that in America. In America, if people are successful financially, we actually applaud them. We want to emulate them. We want to be like them. Well, at the beginning of the show, I mentioned to you about Mark and Sally's enthusiasm, and you can see what I was getting at. I love the way they got those probing questions to get the best out of me. And if you got some benefit from this, especially if you are a millennial or you know somebody who is who's aspiring to become more successful, more wealthy, please pass the message on. That's the aim of this show. So at every uh, podcast app, there's a share button. Just click at the bottom of the page, usually on the iPhones. And what you could do, please, is tell somebody, a couple of people about it, because let's spread the message and help as many people as possible become financially successful. And you can also spread the message by leaving a review. And I got this great one from AJP. Why are all the nicknames taken? And he left it in Apple Podcasts. Now, if I read out your review, as I am for AJP's one, and you email me, michael at metropole.com.au, when you've heard your your review being read out, I'd love to say thank you by gifting you a book, michael at metropole.com.au. Anyway, this review said inspiring, educational, thought-provoking, objective, and he left quite a long review, so thank you so much. Michael Yardney provides an excellent podcast about property investment with easy-to-understand, unemotional, unbiased, data-driven, and compelling explanations. However, I also really appreciate the life lessons that Yardney gives that apply to topics that are broader than property. After all, the lessons that work in property investment also work in many other contexts of life. While I'm not in the position to invest in property at the moment, apart from the, my principal place of residence, Yadney's podcast has definitely inspired me to do so in the future. And I know that when I do, there'll be a team of professionals eagerly waiting to provide me with valuable advice. Highly recommended, not just in the current or future, to current or future investors, but to everyone. Well, gee, that's such a great testimonial. Thank you so much, AJP. And sure, even if you're not ready to buy to invest yet, we talk about money, success, finance, tax, a whole lot of areas of your life where you're probably going to want to improve to give your family, yourself, a better future. So twice a week, I'm going to be bringing you a new episode of the Michael Yardney podcast. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?